Uh, this work is about a solution to a uh, seemingly fundamental trade-off between user privacy and policy enforcement seen in networks today. Suppose you connect to a public network, say at a university or office or even this conference. Uh, it's common for these networks to inspect traffic using a device called a middle box. Um, so any message you send is subject to some high-level policy checks and is only forwarded to an external server if all those policy checks pass. Uh, an example of such a policy check is content filtering. Uh, there's a block list of websites that you're not allowed to access. And um, this is commonly enforced using DNS filtering. So if you make a DNS query, the middle box will check if, you're, is if, if your query is on the block list and will only forward it to the external DNS server if the query is not there. Right? So, but what if your query was encrypted? Uh, this is increasingly common as encry encrypted DNS protocols like DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS are supported by all major browsers today. So in these protocols, the, the client and the web, um, DNS server, they have a TLS session with a shared key. So there's no way for the middle box to read what's in the message. So it cannot read the URL and do the filtering check as before. And this is a real problem in practice. In fact, this has been quite a, a, a rallying point against encrypted DNS as a concept. Uh, and usually whenever this content filtering is required, encrypted DNS is banned. In fact, even Firefox has a workaround that lets network administrators disable encrypted DNS for all users within their network. So this issue is really a microcosm of a general privacy versus policy debate. Um, users want to use encryption and encrypted versions of protocols for privacy, but this encryption is directly at odds with traffic inspection checks, some of which could be vital. For example, most companies perform malware scanning and data loss prevention on their traffic, and um, at schools in the US, it's legally required to perform uh, content filtering. Good. So in this work, we ask, so the central question of our work is this. Can we get the best of both worlds? Can we get uh, policy enforcement without sacrificing the privacy of our users? Um, and in this talk, I'll try to convince you that, yes, we do have a solution, and um, we use zero-knowledge proofs for it. Right. So in a sentence, a zero-knowledge proof lets a prover convince a verifier the truth of some statement involving hidden data without revealing what the hidden data is. Um, so more on them later, but let's forward to our solution that we give. So as before, the client will send an encrypted message and it'll go through the middle box. Um, but this time the client is given the policy. And using the policy, the client generates a proof that their message is policy compliant. And here the middle box only has to verify the proof uh, and it's convinced that the message is policy compliant. So we get uh, privacy here because the underlying plain text is never revealed. Uh, the uh, middle box only sees the cipher text. And we also get policy here because the proof convinces the middle box that the message was policy compliant. So this seems pretty reasonable. So what's the, what's the real challenge here? It, it's, of course, uh, um, generating zero-knowledge proofs that are efficient. Um, and we've given ourselves an even more ambitious goal of making these proofs work with TLS 1.3 as is. So that means we have to use the cipher suites that TLS provides, and also we don't want to weaken any of the privacy guarantees that TLS mandates. Um, in particular, we also don't want to change the server side of protocols. And um, in the uh, previous example, the, the DNS server is completely oblivious to the proof happening. There have been many interesting works in this area of proving things about encrypted data. Um, for example, MCTLS, Blindbox, and Deco. Um, these works don't satisfy our goals, uh, or they're not applicable to proving things about client messages as well. So we could have um, provided suggestions to TLS 1.3 and built a proof system around that. That makes it more amenable to faster proofs. But uh, we didn't want to do that. We didn't think it was going to be realistic to expect uh, changes to TLS 1.3. So following the advice of a former Boston resident, um, we asked not what TLS could do for us, we asked what we can do for TLS. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to give a brief intro to zero-knowledge proofs, and I'm going to design, talk about how we design uh, zero-knowledge proof statements for our middle boxes, and finally, our implementation for uh, DNS filtering. Right, okay, so uh, zero-knowledge proof uh, involves a statement that's a true or false statement. And um, it has two parties, a prover and a verifier. So the statement takes some inputs that are public and some that are private to only the prover. 
And the goal of the prover is to convince the middle box, uh, the verifier, that uh, the statement outputs true. The middle box only sees the public parts of the input. And um, so uh, the soundness guarantee is that a false statement can never be proved. And the zero knowledge guarantee is that the middle box learns nothing about the private inputs. Great. So zero knowledge proofs have been around for over 30 years. Um, and over the past 10 years, there have been many efficient constructions. Um, you might have known them as snarks uh, that um, allow for proving, uh, generating proofs over general statements. But um, these, the catch here is that these require gen re representing the statement as an arithmetic circuit, um, which is a problem for us because um, when we're dealing with network messages, uh, these involve legacy functions like AES and Cha and Chacha uh, Cha -Cha, that are very inefficient when represented as arithmetic circuits. Um, this is a hurdle that we have to deal with, and in fact, we, we just have to be uh, very tight in our usage of these functions when designing uh, proof statements. Great. Um, so let's talk about what the statements actually look like for our ZK MBs. So the goal of the client is to say that the ciphertext that I sent um, decrypts to some plain text that passes the policy check that was specified, right? So the first phase is to actually get the plain text from the ciphertext. And the second phase is uh, from this plain text, we will extract out the bits of information that are relevant to uh, verify that the policy check passes. So this is, these are like the three broad phases of a zero knowledge middle box statement. And of course, you can substitute the policy check for whatever other policy check. And each of these statements might require more public inputs, more private inputs, and such. Um, so in this talk, I'll zoom into just the channel opening part, because that has some interesting challenges with TLS 1.3. Right, so if you want to decrypt uh, ciphertext in zero knowledge, you would think that it's sufficient to, or I would think that it's sufficient to give the key as a private input to the statement and uh, run the decryption within the, the circuit. This doesn't work with TLS 1.3, because TLS 1.3 does not support any key committing encryption schemes. So that means it's possible for uh, uh, the client to have generated a ciphertext that decrypts to two different uh, plaintexts under two different keys. Uh, one of the plaintexts could be a valid one that um, passes the, the, the policy check, but the real ciphertext that was sent, the real plaintext that was sent could have been an invalid, uh, and that wouldn't have passed the check. And this attack is possible and uh, ruins the security of our uh, ZKMB statements. The underlying reason here is that, um, again, TLS 1.3 doesn't support any key binding encryption schemes, unlike TLS 1.2. Right. So how do we solve this? Uh, we, uh, we have to rederive the TLS session key within our proof statement. And for this, we take parts of the handshake transcript as input, um, so, and then we rederive the session key, get the key, and then run the decryption. Um, so there's a unique key that can be derived from a handshake transcript, so this is actually secure. Uh, but this uh, turns out to be the costliest part of our proof statements, and um, for efficiency, we do find ways to shortcut the derivation process and also to um, amortize one key derivation proof over an entire session. Great. So uh, let's talk about DNS filtering over here. So um, in DNS filtering, uh, we we take the uh, plain, plain text, is a sorry, ciphertext of the DNS query, uh, decrypt it to uh, plain text of the query, and then we extract the URL from it. So now our task is to check if the URL is in the block list. So what we do is we represent the block list as a Merkle tree, uh, an ordered Merkle tree, and this supports uh, Merkle non-membership proofs that uh, can be checked within our other statement. Um, this is actually very efficient because uh, there have been uh, recent like, circuit-friendly hash functions whose representation in, as an arithmetic circuit is extremely efficient. So uh, this policy check is very fast. So the biggest cost for us still remains the channel opening with the key derivation and decryption. Right. So we implemented this using the XJSNARC library and the GROT16 proof system. Um, and when we first started this, we weren't sure what to expect uh, with the verification time, uh, proving times. Um, but we were pleasantly surprised to see that our system was very, very close to practical. Um, the verification time is very fast. It takes like well under five milliseconds. Um, uh, but the proof size is also very, uh, very short. It's 128 uh, bytes. The only bottleneck remaining is the prover time. It's about, it takes about 15 seconds to open a TLS session that could be long-lived. 
Um, but once you open a session, the amount of um, the time that it takes to generate a, a proof about a DNS query is around three seconds, which is still uh, a bit too much latency for an application like DNS, but there's a lot of scope for improvement. Um, like I said, these proof systems aren't designed to work on like legacy functions, or, uh, so um, we, can, we are trying out different protocol-specific optimizations for this. Um, there, we can also try out different proof systems, and each of these offer different trade-offs between uh, prover time and uh, verifier time. All right. So in conclusion, this is what uh, Zero Knowledge Middlebox is. We allow clients to prove that their messages are policy compliant using Zero Knowledge proofs. Um, we've implemented policy checks like DNS filtering and HTTP firewalls in our uh, paper, um, but our framework is very modular. You can plug in your own policy check uh, and it'll work. Um, but we hope that this work illustrates a path towards avoiding these uh, or res resolving these uh, privacy versus policy trade-offs in uh, other applications. Um, in particular, we show that it's uh, very close to practical to generate proofs about messages encrypted with TLS 1.3. And there are lots of interesting research problems in this area. Uh, for example, in, in cryptography side, we want to design uh, proof systems that are very practical for um, uh, messages. Uh, sorry, for um, messages involving legacy functions. And on the networking side, we want to implement um, network architectures that incorporate uh, zero knowledge proofs. So we have an implementation available, and uh, you can see and test our circuits over there. Um, and please do check it out. And thanks for listening.